So medicine is the most common way to treat chronic pain. And there's a whole gamut of medicines, but we're gonna focus this discussion on the use of opioids, Vicodin, uh, Oxycontin, narcotics like that. Mm. And even though none of our profile patients use them, they are a very important part of treatment. We're not gonna be talking about their illegal use when they're diverted and sold on the street. We really wanna discuss their legitimate use for chronic pain patients. So let's start with the benefits. Dr. Uh, Taba, what do you see as some of the benefits of using these drugs? Uh, there is no doubt about it that opioid therapy, it was uh, one of the ther most oldest therapies that been used by humanity since 3,500 years uh, BC. Till now, it is the same medication that derived from opium. These medications are very effective in controlling pain. Now, we know that it is very effective in controlling acute pain. In the chronic pain scenarios, it is it's a great medication if it's used in the proper population, in the proper patients, and in the proper scenarios, as give them a window of opportunity to achieve functionality so they can improve their activities and, and advance to a second level of their life. So Dr. Donato, what do you that. say in terms of the benefits the, for these The benefit, I think, is that we can provide patients who are in pain with a window of opportunity that they can use to engage their own activity in the pursuit of healing. So it's like a transition tool. Well, it, it, what it is is it, it, if you can relieve pain enough that patients can exercise, that they can re-engage in recreation, re-engage in social activity, go back to work, engage with their families, now you've created a system that gets the, the patient on the road to healing more quickly. Now what are some of the risks? Well, uh, opioid is a medication actually that it's so funny that many elderly patients, for example, say, will say that we'll give them a little bit of Vicodin, they come back, Dr. Taba, I don't want it, this thing here. The constipation is more horrible than my pain. I would prefer to die in pain. I don't want to have a constipation. One of the examples of how horrible the side effect from, the, from, from for certain people. We noticed that there's some patient develop something called uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is that means the patient become more sensitive to the pain despite the fact that they're getting large doses of morphine or pain medication. So the more more pain medication you give them, then became more sensitive and more to stimuli that causes their pain. So it can make their pain worse? It causes, yes. Now we have respiratory suppression that the patient may end up having significant uh, respiration, you know, especially a patient with obese, so they have sleep apnea. You give them these, uh, these opioid may stop breathing so and they die from it. Breathing problems. That's right. Sexual dysfunction is another, another thing that happened with the chronic opioid usage. And Dr. Janata, what are some other risks you see? So I see really three major risks. The hyperalgesia that Dr. Taba mentioned, that is that opiates can make pain worse. The second is that we unnecessarily are providing an opportunity to expose a vulnerability to addiction in a population that may not otherwise be exposed to it, and we have to be able to ad address and assess that risk up front, which can be hard to do. And the third is that chronic pain is accompanied in the majority of cases by depression, and depression uh, can masquerade sometimes or accompany the symptoms of pain or be expressed as pain. And so the risk is that if you apply a central nervous system depressant, like an opiate, to someone who's already depressed, it can make the depression worse. So they could feed off each other in a negative way. Yes. And, um, you know, no matter what treatment, whether it's the opioids, whether it's a surgical intervention, it seems like the patient really has to take an active role in this whole treatment picture. Well, when we think about the, the importance of optimizing function, if we use any medical treatment, opiate or any other, it has to be in the service of optimizing function. And so we can create a quid pro quo, where a patient uses an opiate, but also engages themselves in the active pursuit of health. So no matter what, the bottom line, there's no magic pill to manage chronic pain. So here's the takeaway if you or a family member suffers from chronic pain. Number one, you likely will never be completely pain-free. Number two, you can't be passive. Patients have to take an active role in treatment. And finally, chronic pain management requires a multifaceted approach, which often includes lifestyle changes as well as therapies for the mind, body, and soul. To learn more about chronic pain, visit our website at health.ideastream.org. There you'll find web-exclusive material exploring complementary and alternative remedies for pain, including massage and acupuncture, plus a report on migraines. 
View special content provided by our partner, Net Wellness, a consumer health website offered as a public service from medical schools at Case Western Reserve University, the University of Cincinnati, and The Ohio State University. There's also a place to share your experience with chronic pain. Go to health.ideastream.org. Watch, listen, and click. Funding for Body in Pain comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, the Woodruff Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County.